everybody, and welcome to Life Hacker. This is uh, the Ask Life Hacker podcast for m- the week of Monday, April sixteenth. Sixteenth. Uh, with me is Adam Dotches. That's true. Whitson Gordon. Also true. Thorin Klazowski is He's joining us there. via Skype. Uh, we see him in front of us. But uh, you can see him on your screen. And uh, hi, I'm Adam Pash. Uh, <laughs> so. We got a lot of news to talk about, uh, a lot of questions to answer, so let's jump right into it. Okay, so first big, kind of, it was huge news last week uh, for people who cared about Instagram, a photo sharing service that was bought by Facebook, and people who didn't care about Instagram. Facebook dropped a billion dollars on yeah, Instagram, which is kind that was of surprising. the, it's kind One of the thing that I think made everyone. <laughs> want to talk about the whole Instagram thing. Everyone was weighing in, everyone had an opinion. How many people here actually were using Instagram? I just started, I'm an Android user, so I only got it last yeah. week, so I just, I've, I've taken one picture on Instagram. Okay, I was using it, Adam. I was using it, but like, only, I, sometimes I, I forget that my phone has a camera. Yeah. So there's that. How about you, phone? Nope, never used it before. Okay, so Instagram, anyway, it's a photo sharing service. The whole purpose of it is you basically, you can take a picture. If you so choose, you can apply some wacky filter to it, which um, will make it look retro or like washed out or whatever. It's kind of fun, and then you share it with friends. It's like a tiny micro social network that actually was quite large, Mm -hmm. um, but it was limited to basically your camera, and then you could show people links on the web, but there was no real website to it. Yeah, for Mm -hmm. something that wasn't developed out a whole lot, it was kind of amazing how much it it picked up, because there there were a lot of other sites that let you do more, and there were a ton, when they finally released an API, so many people built websites of like, here's how you can manage your Instagram, and here's how you can see all your photos on a big page and a gallery and everything. And so for me, the reason I liked Instagram, and like, I still like it, mm-hmm. nothing has gone wrong with it at this mm-hmm. point, it's still just the same uh, app, is that it was a fun way to sort of like, I was taking more pictures, I was sharing with it, and I sort of had a, a group of people who I was following and who were following me that I was actually interacting with in a way that I just, I never did on Facebook, it's, it's very specifically limited to one thing, so if you were if you were enjoying taking and sharing photographs, it was like a good way to do it. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of concern though, Facebook uh, bought it for a billion dollars, um, and they are, and, and, and the concern is that Facebook's going to come in and, and I guess like ruin this beautiful little yeah. mini social network. It can't literally be a billion dollars either, I mean that's got to be, there's got to be a lot of stock in that or something. I actually, I think like 400 million to each founder. Really? Um, yeah. Of, oh of actual God. cash? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not 100%. I don't anyway, really don't. that money. Facebook has all the money. Oh, yeah. Um, totally. But anyway, uh, the, the main concern is Facebook will come in. It's going to be littered with likes and comments from Facebook, which mm-hmm. actually is true. I, I, I have Instagram automatically posting stuff to my Facebook account, but I also don't. I don't look at people commenting on it, like yeah. the comments and, and likes yeah. and stuff, I only pay attention to it within Instagram, which is because mm. it's sort of a cultivated group that I like inside of it, that is yeah. for that purpose. Yeah. Sometimes I go on there and I'm like, where did this come from? I didn't, like, I didn't know, I have like four people following me and I don't know who they are. For me, the, the whole draw of Instagram is how easy it is to share things to Facebook. And then yeah. as a heavy, because I know you're not a heavy Facebook user, but I am a very heavy yeah. Facebook user. So that's like the main focal point for me. It's like super quick to share it to Facebook and then I can read the comments and so like from there. So it's a potential win for so you. So like, yeah, I don't see how, like that's the best part of it for yeah, me. Yeah, I don't, I don't think any of us really have an issue with the, with, with this. Yeah, I kind of want to wait and see before yeah. I start yeah, yelling about it. Yeah, it's a total wait and see. Thorne, where are you at? I have no opinion, really. Thorin could, <laughs> could not care Thorin less. doesn't use Facebook or Instagram. <laughs> um, but, but, okay, so Instagram has always gotten a lot of guff because it's mm. like, oh, you take a picture and you put trendy filters on it and then you upload it in, like, a crappy resolution. Mm. Whatever. It, it's if, fun. But if you don't like Instagram, we actually have covered yeah, we many ha- alternatives for both iOS and Android. Yeah, we got six for iOS and five for Android, and most of them are pretty good, and you can uh, and and are also free and still independent. So, and there's some you can pay for if you want, you know, certain features that one other doesn't have. But there are definitely, I mean, like Pick Please, for example, is pretty close mm-hmm. to what Instagram is, and that's available on both platforms. And the nice thing about Android is every camera app can share directly to Facebook or Twitter or whatever app yeah. you want because of Android's built-in sharing mm-hmm. function. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Cool. so anyway, that's the Instagram. 
It's interesting. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Facebook could ruin it. I wouldn't it get, could I wouldn't be, get it too could remain worked really up yet. Good. Except I, I, the certain thing, the most shocking part of it is a billion dollars. Yeah, one billion dollars. Uh, so also last week, uh, Google <coughs> Plus uh, redesigned, and if you haven't seen the redesign, uh, it's basically like if you've ever used Twitter for Mac, the official Twitter client, it's like half that and half uh, Facebook's timeline, mm -hmm. and then just like like cleaned up and a lot of like more white space and. Whatnot. I was gonna say with a lot of white space. It's in my opinion, it's an improvement. A significant improvement. Yeah, it's it's much good. better looking. Um, it's like a lot more intuitive in my mind. Um, but not everyone loves it. Uh, well, there's something you can do about that, right? There is something you can do about that. <laughs> Thorne, did you write the post about the white space remover? Yeah, and it essentially just puts everything centered in the screen, puts some gray bars on the side, and that's really it. <laughs> I mean, it only <laughs> makes a difference on like a big widescreen monitor. So it removes the white space, but it doesn't actually add like anything useful, or, like stretch out the actual text in a way that makes the page more efficient. No, it's really only if you're looking at Google Plus full screen for some reason I, okay. on I, a widescreen monitor. I feel like they should have thought that through a little bit. Like put something else in there. Well, Google's never been really. If you really want to fill up that white space, I did just see some uh, like Chrome extensions up today that will just put pictures of like Betty White in that white <laughs> space or something. And I was like, this seems ridiculous, but I guess course. it's better than nothing. So just uh, to take another little quick poll, who's using Google Plus regularly? I stopped when I, I have too many Google accounts, and if they would let me transfer over my Gmail to something else. Like I don't want to use, they made me get a Gmail account. I have all this crap on my Gmail account. I, I would use it, but I have to keep switching accounts. Whitson. Not even a little bit. Well, okay, a little bit. I use it to, to crowdsource questions. If I have questions, I'm like, what's a good program to do this? I find that Google yeah, Plus is the most is. helpful yeah, network for that. Foreign? I'm still struggling to figure out what to do with it exactly. <laughs> Trick question. You're all using Google Plus because you upgraded <laughs> your accounts. And Google Plus is not the network, it's a social layer that exists across <laughs> all Google products. If you're logged in, you're using it. Shoot. Yeah. Um, which is Google's been Google's line, and, and it's how they describe 170 million people as actively using Google Plus. Yeah, it's kind of a cop out. I will say this. I actually I do use Google Plus because I use Google Hangouts because it's amazing. But That's I do not use true. any of the rest of Google Plus at all. I we, kind of wish Hangouts was just a separate yeah, we, we do our, our weekly uh, life hacker feature meetings in Go in Google Hangouts. Oh, that's true. It's yeah. awesome. And I hang out with my family regularly on Google Hangouts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just but... free and it's great group chat. And now it looks a little prettier and maybe with too much white space. <laughs> <laughs> All right, breaking news: as of last Friday, uh, <laughs> you breaking a terms of service. Uh, agreement in software agreements and whatnot is not actually you you cannot be you're not doing anything illegal if you break a terms of service uh, Thorin you wrote this post can you break it down for us yeah so basically it's not a crime a federal crime um, under the ninth district <laughs> so it's still a little iffy on how it's gonna be applied everywhere else um, but it's basically just updating the language in the law, or they want to update the language in the law to reflect what's actually going on, um, you know, in a terms of service. Um, but you can still be held, I mean, it's still a civil lawsuit can go through, which is good because you want the power to sue, you know, a, a company as well. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of the, the basics of it right there. Um, and so, and you wrote, you wrote this post, uh, what, a month or so ago about how to um, sort of skim a terms of service agreement to mm -hmm. basically get a gist for what's going on in it without spending, what, like four hours yeah. reading <laughs> iTunes 80 page terms of service agreement? Right. Um, what's the basic, like, the basic quick, quick version of that for anyone who didn't read your post? Um, I think it's basically just to look for certain keywords dealing with your privacy is kind of the biggest thing right now. Um, and what, um, you know, what Google or Facebook or whatever could do with your information right. without you knowing about it. Um, and also being able to sue. So like looking for like arbitration issues and stuff in case you are bothered by something or something happens right. along the line, you can always, you know, take it to court. So at the end of the day, it's interesting. You can't be, you can't be, um, uh, taken where right, breaking a terms of service isn't a crime. However, obviously, it's still um, useful to read a terms of service agreement for things like your privacy, like you're saying. Yeah. You, yeah. you may not be charged with a crime for breaking it, but like 
you also don't want people to use all your personal information and post it to Facebook right. every second of the day. The, the big thing for me is it, people can finally stop saying that jailbreaking your iPhone is illegal. Yeah. We're like, we're like, well, it's not anyway. It's, it's not, but, but people keep saying that. And like this, it's like, no, it's breaking the terms of service. And now we have very clear-cut language that says breaking the yeah, terms of service good. is not a crime. So yeah. can we stop saying that? two arguments. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, on another legal front... Lifehacker Law continues its campaign. <laughs> uh, SOPA, everyone knows SOPA. SOPA mm-hmm. was the agreement, or the, uh, the law that, was, that we're trying to push through that would um, basically make websites liable for any uh, copyright infringement, infringing content that went on the websites. SOPA is basically dead, um, mm-hmm. but there is a new, uh, there's a new, there's something new being pushed through, Bill, yes. There's a new bill being pushed through, or at least starting through the process, called CISPA? KISPA? I don't know. Thorne, how were you saying that in your head? I was saying it's CISPA, but I don't know where I got that from. C-I-S-P-A. Yeah, I was too. So. Which stands yeah, for what? We got three. C-I-S-P-A? Yeah. Thorne, you got that? What was no. that? What's, what does CISPA stand for? Uh... <laughs> Copyright infringement something P agreement. It's, it's the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act. Okay. Oh. Um, and basically, wow. uh, the interesting thing about CISPA, obviously now there's a lot of this stuff that is like, mm-hmm. it's in the news constantly because SOPA was such a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, but the interesting thing about CISPA so far is that it's being backed by Thorin? Uh, Facebook, Microsoft, IBM. I think AT and T, Verizon, Netflix, even right? No, Nef- that was everyone got that. Okay, wrong. Netflix was involved. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, that was in our remains. I saw it yesterday, and and I'm like, oh, that would have been good to know. I wish I, because I was upset with Netflix. That I day. was too. And so, Thorin, just to explain briefly, why is it people are, uh, why is it all these services uh, and and companies that were anti SOPA are now pro CISPA? Well, I think it kind of boils down to CISPA deals with. Um, protecting their information and protecting them against uh, like hackers and cybersecurity issues. Um, and so that's good for them. They don't have to really worry about, you know, SOPA's problems of, of them being held accountable for anything really. And that's, I mean, that's really what CISPA is supposed to be. That's all it's supposed to be is just about security. So what is the, what's the gotcha? The gotcha is some vague language dealing with uh, what uh, constitutes that security and what a breach could be um, regarding intellectual property. Mm-hmm. Um, and it kind of just doesn't make any sense for it to be in there. I think it's supposed to be for code, maybe? Like if someone you know, busted into Facebook, stole their code, they would want to you know, be able to, to sue for that and attract people for doing that. Um, and there's also kind of a, a warrantless um, way to track privacy and for companies to share that information with the government if they choose to. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the other concern. And companies don't have to do it, but they're you know pressured to. Gotcha. Okay, so uh, did you have something to say? No. Okay. Could, it could be worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, we'll see where it goes. Uh, yeah. I, at this point, it's like things get a lot of attention earlier. It's funny because when SOPA uh, was first sort of rumbling last year, at, toward the end of last year, you wrote a post about it yeah. that was like sort of quietly, I, people paid attention to it, but then like a few months later it was like, it went, blew up. Yeah, we just reposted it and then everyone was like yeah. crazy. So this is one to watch. Yeah, yeah. keeping an eye on it. Uh, so anyway, uh, on a brighter note, video blogger extraordinaire oh, yeah. Zay Frank is back uh, doing his awesome video podcasts. He had a new one, uh, or I guess it was an intro one. Uh, mm. that came out last week that was an mm. invocation for beginnings mm. um, and it was a lovely video <laughs> I don't know if any of you watched it I watched yeah. it yeah. Um, Zay Frank is, is super good at just like stream of consciousness uh, motivation <laughs> which sounds maybe uh, cheesy but yeah. he's excellent at it and mm. his videos are always really but enjoyable to he watch he does it in a funny way and he doesn't it, it's, it's like it's, he takes himself seriously without taking himself too seriously and so it's it's always very charming, uh, the, every, all the videos he does. And then the the first episode that went up too is I'm really looking forward to seeing how that goes because he put out that call yeah. uh, for that guy to animate people's dreams, which should be very interesting to see how that comes about. So anyway, that's just a short. Uh, 
announcement from fans, yeah. really. Uh, but it, it's also his 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 shows are always have like a little bit of a life hacker bent to it in terms of productivity and like motivation. So uh, I would definitely recommend, especially since we're talking to a lot of podcast and video cast listeners, uh, yeah. checking him out. Mm-hmm. So that's it for news this week. Let's answer some questions. <laughs> Our first question comes from a caller in Salt Lake City. I have an old computer that I'm planning to replace. I'm wondering which is better, an older but cheaper or a newer, more expensive desktop? Or should I just get a laptop instead? I plan to use it for mostly web browsing, but I do also like to listen to music while playing games. Well, Whitson, you've written a lot about what kind of computer you should buy if you should go for sort of like the souped up awesome processor. Yes. So, and a lot of it, and so a lot of it comes down to the different components in your system. I will say this. Um, I, I'm glad that he's at least asking this question because a lot of people these days are like, oh, I always have to have the latest and greatest thing. And, oh, Intel's Ivy Bridge processors are coming out, so I gotta wait for that. And to be completely honest, it does not matter at this point yeah when, when it comes to processors at least still talk just, about, i read something about ivy bridge and how it's going to be this huge upgrade when it gets into a macbook pro and it's yeah. they say that every it's time just Apple not an if you're running a core 2 duo or higher mm-hmm. or definitely if you're running a core i series and higher you probably don't need to worry about it because you're not probably not taking advantage of that processor anyway unless you're probably video editing yeah. or or you know ripping a lot of dvds and something like that even if you're gaming you're probably not taking advantage of um most of it um, the if if you're going to be gaming, especially if you're gaming and listening to music or gaming and watching videos, you'll definitely want a, a pseudo newer video card. So you don't want to get a, a computer that's super old, but you definitely don't need the latest and greatest. I was running tons of modern games on a computer with a you know fifty dollar or whatever ninety eight hundred GT, and it was completely fine. Um, again, Ian, you said you might be able to get a laptop if you want to just get a MacBook Pro or whatever, or, or a you know a comparable machine that has a dedicated video card. That's fine too. Um, mm-hmm. Definitely no need to go out and spend a ton of money on the latest and greatest. Yeah, I mean there are definitely some inexpensive. I mean you could also build a six hundred dollar PC. Building a computer is the best because you can choose what kind of processor you want. Mm-hmm. You don't need you know you can maybe go a little bit cheaper. If you want a fast computer, get an SSD. I know we sound like a broken record because we talk about this all the time. But you could choose to get an SSD. You could choose exactly what video card you want. You can make it as expensive or inexpensive and as powerful or as not powerful as you want. It's well, there's, that, there's that Core i5 hack mini that um, I started put that I put together for for a post at one point or we did a sample build for the Hackintosh guide. Yes. And you know I mean doesn't matter what operating system you install on it. That thing was really fast and it was about three hundred and fifty dollars. Very yeah, that's a really solid machine. Um, I don't know how many what kind of games you can play on it or how uh, awesome the graphics are necessarily work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well there's that. But anyway, so you can build you can build a pretty solid machine for pretty cheaply at the end of the day, gaming is always going to be like the one asterisk. It's going to be Basically. if you are if you need to get like every last like push every frame rate to yep. the like highest most extreme place, um, you're gonna. It depends on what games you're playing too. If you're talking mm-hmm. about like World of Warcraft, Whatever. like you can go you can go pretty cheap on that and still have a really great experience. If you're talking like Skyrim, Battlefield Three you're probably going to want to spend a little bit more money to make sure that it, it runs okay. I like to have Wits in here to say names of video games. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to start name dropping things. I, I would have to be like, if you're talking like... Solitaire! Doom 3! <laughs> <laughs> um, well played. Uh, yeah, well, job security. Thor and you and I would be playing the Mother series in an emulator, so... <laughs> He's but anyway, so I highly recommend um, checking out our build. We have many build guides on Lifehacker for building your own computer. Check out all of those. Um, but de- definitely, you can probably build a cheap computer for more powerful than you realize. Yep. Or build a powerful computer for more cheaply than you realize. Sorry. Okay. Uh, our second question comes from Cautious Coffee Drinker, who writes, I know the common knowledge is that there are risks when you use a coffee shop's internet, but realistically, what is the chance that there is a skilled enough hacker to access my passwords or whatever else it is they do? Furthermore, if you're in a Starbucks, you connect to an AT&T Wi-Fi network that you need an account for. Is that any more secure? So what, I'm risking, what am I risking exactly, and what are the chances I'm going to get hacked? Uh, is it really worth being so cautious about? 
Um, I would say yes, it is worth being so cautious about. Mm -hmm. In general, um, sure, you probably aren't going to... There's probably not someone sitting there all the time. There's probably not someone waiting for you out your door always who's going to mug you. But that doesn't mean that the one time someone mugs you, it isn't going to suck. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, really, it's really easy to... It doesn't take a skilled hacker to actually sniff your your network. Nope. What's going on? It's mm -hmm. it's pretty easy. Anyone can do it. You just run a program and like press a button that says capture, and all you need to do at that point then is just sort of they look through the logs and they could sit there capturing for hours and then later yep. go through the logs and do like a search that's going to sort of weed out any passwords that may have gone through. Of course, we've talked about this before, but if you're connecting to websites with uh, SSL uh, and you can tell by the, the front of the browser, it'll be HTTPS. Uh, and we've talked about this a ton of times, uh, but like sites like Google, uh, Facebook, Twitter, they all do this by default when you're logging in. When you're logging in on those sites, that secure connection will mean that a sniffer can't find your password. But it, there are tons of other sites where that's not happening. Um, and the danger, of course, is if it, even if it's a site that you don't care that much about, if you then are using a password and a username that you're using elsewhere, someone will take that and just start experimenting. And, uh, and, and they have and your password to yeah. everything. Um, you know, it sucks, but that's, that is what it is. Yeah, but there's HTTPS everywhere. And installing that, it's a Chrome now. It's an exception oh, for Chrome Firefox for Firefox extension. originally. And actually, um, I think it even does it Safari. I feel like they've gone nuts with it. But yeah. Well, I, maybe there. Yeah, there may be Safari. Anyway, no one cares. Whatever. Chrome and Firefox. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can install it, and it will automatically direct you to the HTTPS version of that uh, um, of that any site, site that supports thousands it. Yeah. Of websites, thousands of sites. Um, yeah. But the important thing is to like just look in in your in your address bar and see if it says HTTPS, and if it doesn't, don't submit anything that yep. you're worried about. I, I do want to make one more note uh, because you mentioned you have to log in uh, with your AT and T account to connect to this Wi-Fi network, mm -hmm. and that does not usually make it safer because the way a lot of these Wi-Fi networks are set up is that the Wi-Fi network is open. But mm -hmm. to connect to the internet, you have to log in through their web page. That mm -hmm. is not the same as typing in a password to access the Wi-Fi right. network. So even if you are logging in with AT&T, someone else can still come in, go get into the Wi-Fi network without logging in and access anything you're doing because they're on the same network as you. They don't need their AT&T account to sniff your stuff. Yeah, and so don't, yeah, you maybe use a different password. I mean, you should probably be using different passwords That's in general, right. but... For your for your Wi-Fi logins, that's probably the. But so just to clarify, um, the difference with uh elucidating what? <laughs> no idea what that word. <laughs> the difference means. that Winston is trying to point out is that is the difference between going to a website, being redirected to a login, or or like logging into a network with like WPA security on yes. like the connection level. Um, so pay attention to what it is. If it is secure then if it's a secure login where you're actually putting in a password uh, through like this is the SSID and then this is the password for that, that is se more, secure, more secure. But at the same time, if he had an account, he could also log in and still be on the same network as you. So that doesn't make a huge yes, difference. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, so anyway, it is what it is. It's better to be safe than sorry. Yep. Yep. All right, our third question, and I have a note that says this needs to be read verbatim. <laughs> Dear life hacker, hi. I'm a 10-year-old kid. The question is, why does my internal storage on my Android device have so little space when all of my apps are stored in the memory card? With a Vodafone Huawei U8650, you only get about 150 megabytes of internal storage. By, B-Y-E, comma, Android user who has small amount of space on the phone. Uh, it's a pretty eloquent 10-year-old kid. Yeah. Yeah, and a very good question. Uh, and applies to more than people, than just those with the Vodafone phone that I don't know how to pronounce. Um, <laughs> yes. So, Thorin, got some advice? Well, the, the internal storage is basically just kind of holding the Android OS. Um, and then on top of that, it kind of starts to accumulate, you know, some random things like contacts and things like that. Um, which you can go in in your settings um, and look up and start deleting things that are taking up space. Um, which Whitson, you might be able to walk through that a little bit. Well, cleaner. it also it also contains all your apps. So the best way to free up storage first is to go through your apps and see if there's anything. Well, that he you, said, he says his install. apps are on his. On his oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I completely missed that already. Well, yeah, uh, so so he's already got that, but yeah, I mean, like anything. Oh, on and all the, of my apps are stored on the memory card. Okay, wow. So yeah, that's. 
that is a lot tougher. I completely missed that part. Um, yeah, that's definitely something you, you go into the settings and you can go to settings, applications, um, I think manage, and kind of go through your apps and, and delete any data that you don't need, although a lot of that is also stored on the SD card, unfortunately. Um, that's a it's a it's a really tough thing to do. It might just be you know that's one of the the things that you sacrifice you with know, a cheap if, phone. If he feels like going crazy, uh, and if there is uh, say a ROM for uh, a custom ROM, there could be one you could just go yeah. through and find the most lightweight. And it's, it's harder it's harder to find a custom ROM for some of the for more phone, some of the some, yeah for, for some of the more the le the less popular phones. But if you can find uh but that would require. Um, rooting, if you haven't done that already, which and is a big dealing with a lot of complicated things. But so yeah, definitely, definitely keep those apps on your SD card as you know as many as you can, as many will allow it, um, and just see what else is taking up that internal storage. Mm -hmm. A lot of that you can actually look at in your settings, the applications section of your settings. Um, try and see what's taking up the internal storage if it's data or or whatever else. Um, but yeah, that's tough. Okay. Good luck. Uh, our fourth question, I am looking to automate more of my life and I'm looking into using drop folders to auto-convert my videos with Handbrake. Drop folders, of course, is a, a, a tool that watches a folder and if any video goes into it, it automatically converts it to a preset video uh, settings is codec. It, is that on Windows cool. or Mac? Uh, drop folders is definitely on, on Windows. Windows. It's Air, right? Yeah, I, think, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I think it's cross-platform. I, I think it might be cross-platform. I know it's on Windows because I've used it. Um, cool. So anyway, and Handbrake is a tool that converts videos, uh, mm. transcodes videos. Uh, so to continue, I am a user of BitTorrent to download multiple video files. My question would be, is there any way to move the videos as they finish to another folder so drop folders can see them and convert them? And in fact, there is. Absolutely. Uh, Whitson has written a post about this. And basically, Did if I? you're using... <laughs> <laughs> we're in New York. We, uh, U-Torrent. I do remember this. New Torrent came out with a new version that uh, automatically scanned videos and let you set up actions and move t uh, files to tags. Basically, what you can do is this. Um, this is the this is the way that you solve this problem, at least. You take... Uh, you, you, I'm assuming you're using New Torrent because it's your best option. Yep. Um, on either platform. When you, you label basically the downloads as, say, video or movie or whatever, and then in the settings you set it up so that when those complete, they move to a new folder. Mm -hmm. So the completed videos go into a new folder. Um, drop folders, can't, can drop folders watch that folder? Yes. So you could just have drops folders watch that folder. Mm -hmm. Another option is if you have a completed like folder, and you just had them automatically go to a completed folder, you could be using something like uh, Belvedere, uh, which is a, an app that I developed that's now being maintained by uh, a nice life hacker reader, very cool life hacker reader named Matthew Shorts. Um, and it monitors folders and moves files wherever you want it to go. Uh, and, uh, and if Drop Folders is indeed available on Mac, uh, there's an app called Hazel, which does basically the same thing that Belvedere does because I copied it when I made Belvedere. <laughs> um, so shamelessly ripped it off. So you can totally do it. Yeah, just yeah, just set Belvedere I hate it, to move all video files to your drop folders, watched folder. I also know I think trans, can't transmission on the Mac. Um, I think it can. You can label files of a different type and have it you know put video files in whatever folder you want. Yeah. So that'll work with both BitTorrent clients. Yep. Yeah. So our last question. Our last question of the day. Uh, reader J B writes. Sometimes listening to music while studying helps me helps calm me, even helps me concentrate better. But not always. <laughs> I've asked friends for their preference and I always get a different answer. My question is, what is the generally recommended way to go? Are there any studies that suggest that music distracts which music distracts the brain? I guess the real question or follow up question is, what kind of music is suitable for studying? Okay, so the, I think we're all going to probably have varying opinions on this. The, the scientific thing is basically, it doesn't really, music doesn't really help you focus more, but if you're in like a noisy area and that's distracting, putting on music can help you focus because it's at least simplifying the noise that you're hearing. Um, so that's good. And then, and then uh, I mean, there's no, there's no magic Beethoven Mozart thing going on, but, you know, I mean, if you, music that's, you know, that, that, I guess doesn't distract you if you're not going to want to sing along with it or whatever and you're just going to let it go in the background and it motivates you some mu music can be faster paced if you need to get a pick me up during the day and then all that stuff I mean there, 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 are, there are bonuses if yeah. it works 
but you know, but there's not necessarily a huge brain benefit. Some people prefer white noise. Right. So it's it's very much a what works for your mm -hmm. situation. Though white noise, pink noise, brown noise, which are mm -hmm. actually different, uh, but they all sound like mostly. <sighs> yeah. Um, are actually super effective at drowning out noise if you don't want the added distraction of yeah. like music. And uh, we've we've covered a few different options for white noise. Yeah, like simplynoise.com. Is, is a web app that does the trick. Um, but but uh, I actually love uh, brown noise is, is really good. <laughs> it's like sort of a lo it's lower. Noise. It's sort of a lower. I don't even remember off the top of my head what like the what's going on. Thorn, do you have any idea of brown no brown noise? What makes the no. Exactly. What do you What do you do when you wear just magic? Just briefly though, brown brown noise, not to be confused with like the brown note, mm. which is the <laughs> thing that makes you defecate yourself. Which I think MythBusters busted. So I've never heard that. That is not thing. brown noise, Thorn. But Thorn, what do you what, what do you like to go for on the music end of things? Um, wait. What do I usually like to like music? Or add to... any two cents that you as, may as, have. As you're, as you're working, what music do you listen to? I think I think the key for me is is kind of like Adam said, like the when there when it's pop music or there's lyrics, that's what's distracting you away from what you're doing, you know. So if it's you know a nice poppy song, 120 beats per minute, like that's great for cleaning, but it's terrible <laughs> yeah. for like trying to write or you know like focus on something. And so I tend to go with just loud instrumental music that kind of just serves as you know one of those four types of noise. Yeah. Soundtrack. That's that's about where I'm at too. I'm I'm usually a soundtrack guy. I listen to the worst. I'm, yeah, you, I have no opinion on. I have nothing to say about this. You know, somehow somehow heavy metal and dubstep works. For you. <laughs> yeah. Whatever works for you, JB. <laughs> Whatever works for you. All right. Time for talking about downloads. <laughs> All right, our first download, uh, Witson, is Win Plus X for Windows. Win Plus X is just a cool little tiny app for Windows. Um, for those of you that have used the Windows 8 Consumer Preview, you might have noticed this cool little feature uh, when you press the Windows key and X as a keyboard shortcut, or if you right-click on the Start Orb, you get this cool little menu that um, just has some frequently accessed but usually hidden tools in Windows like the registry or power control or disk management for creating partitions things that most people don't really use on a regular basis but that, that there aren't obvious shortcuts in mm -hmm. the normal start menu and so Win Plus X is an app for Windows 7, Windows Vista, and Windows XP that adds that feature to previous versions of Windows uh, so you can just hit Win X and you get access to these things that you don't necessarily have obvious shortcuts to Obviously, if, if you are a keyboard user, you can just hit the Windows key and start typing what you're looking for and hit enter, mm -hmm. um, or use something like a launchy. That's a, a quicker way to do it usually. But if you're a little bit more mouse oriented, this is just another cool way to get quicker access to those useful but hidden utilities. Cool. All right, flashback tool oh, for yeah. OS X. For OS X, and it could only be for OS X, because <laughs> if uh, you know, if you if you listened or watched last week, or you've used the internet in <laughs> you know in any of that time, you've heard about the flashback virus uh, or Trojan that uh, Mac OS X was infested with. And this is a tool from the people who found it, F Secure, that will scan your Mac and delete it if it finds it. Mm -hmm. And Apple also has now released a Java update um, that will uh, let you that, that will fix the problem, so there's no vulnerability anymore. And that's basically all it does, but if you have a Mac, you should definitely run it, make sure everything's okay, and then run that update. We'll have links to both in the show notes. Yep. Okay. Uh, morning routine for Android. This, I just thought this app was really cool. I, uh, <laughs> I, there are, we've, we've featured a lot of alarm clock apps just for iPhone and Android, and a lot of them will use clever little things like, oh, you know, you need to do a, like a tiny little math problem in order to stop the alarm so it knows that you're actually awake. Or, you know, some people put their alarm clock on the opposite end of the room so they have to get up out of bed. Morning Routine takes it a step further and makes you scan a barcode or a series of barcodes to stop the alarm from going off. And you decide what barcodes to scan. So I could set up an alarm that goes off and won't stop until I've scanned the barcode on my orange juice carton and my cereal box and my toothpaste 
to ensure that I go through my entire morning routine before I can shut off the alarm, and by that point, I'm wide awake, and I have to get started with my day. Are wait, there wait, barcodes wait. on toothpaste? You have to be so desperate. <laughs> wait, Some people alarm, have a hard time getting up. Is the up. alarm, like, in, in intrusively irritating? All alarms like, are intrusively irritating. Well, it could be, like, a gentle, like, it's, that's going to be the worst out. alarm ever. I slept on my arm today, and I couldn't use my hand for about five minutes, and if that alarm had gone off, that happens, I would be scanning it, and I'd just be dropping the that phone. That actually happens to me about 50% of mornings, and I have to, like, <laughs> fling my arm over to my alarm just to try and hit this, like, hit this news button just to get it to stop. But, so, yes, yeah, so if you have a really hard time waking up in the morning, morning routine is a pretty interesting alarm clock for Android that might just do the trick. You are a desperate human yeah. being. That's Better than I'm the saying. Bill Shredder one. Uh, it's true. Money. The one that money would shred. Shredder. The run that would shred money right, right, right. if you didn't wake up. <laughs> okay, so uh, if you are in fact an app junkie, uh, but you don't want to spend a ton on apps, uh, last week Thorin wrote a post all about getting great deals on Android apps, not just Android apps. Apps yeah, it was in Android and iOS. Tell us about it. So iOS, it's actually really easy. Um, you kind of have App Shopper is the one I prefer just because it's like dead simple to set up. Um, it sends you notifications of any app you want when it drops in price or goes free. Um, so so wait, if you're, Thorne, you know, just quickly, do you use it? Yes. Do you use it like actively? Actively enough. Do you feel like I mean, you're I'm saving not... like a significant, I don't know, like five bucks a week or something? Probably. Be buying a I lot mean, of apps. If, if there's really that much I want. Well, if the, that also, if it is though, like I feel yeah. like you're probably using it more on things that are like this app is ten dollars and then it goes yeah. on sale for five. Yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the I mean, if, if you're if you're using it for something that's like a dollar ninety nine and you're waiting for that price drop, like you know, you're not really gonna get that much out of it. You but, have bigger problems. You know, if there's something for ten bucks, it's definitely worth it. Mm. Cool. Okay. And those sales happen often enough. So anyway, sorry. Go on. Um. That was kind of it. Uh, there, there, I was having trouble finding anything on Android that was similar. Um, and I don't know if that's because it like stuff just doesn't drop in price in the Android market as much, or you know, there's some there's ways to like look up prices, yeah. but there's not like a good notification system when they do. It's also worth saying that a lot of Android apps that would be pay on the iPhone are free on Android because one study came out a while ago. This is Android users don't pay for apps, so no one make you know everyone puts ads <laughs> in their apps instead. Yeah. So is there is there like any sort of schedule or anything that that apps when apps usually drop in prices or any you know like general Indicator. know how that's you know good to be aware of? Yeah, I think like uh, holidays are huge. Doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter how insignificant the holiday is. Um, <laughs> it, it, Flag it just, day. It just happens. Like I think it started like so it, I don't know two years ago, a year ago. Electronic Arts, the gaming company, started doing these holiday sales, mm. and now everyone does them. So you can kind of just count on that happening. Um, also, app anniversaries are huge. Like, if, if it's a year anniversary, they almost always put it discounted at least for the day. Um, those are the two big ones. Cool. That's cool. You can also check out our app deals post that comes out every day on Lifehacker yeah. for whatever the deals are that day. True. Just a little shameless plug there. True that. <laughs> um, okay, and... Uh, Lastly, you also wrote a post last week uh, about using the iPad as a creative tool. And I think we all have iPads, correct? Yep. Yep. Um, and Thorne, though, you interviewed a few people who were, like, using it as part of their jobs. Yeah. And I think the most interesting thing people were doing, I mean, there's, I talked to one musician who uses it as part of his, like, overall setup. So, like, he's got, you know, six keyboards everywhere and, you know, different drum machines and then also that, the iPad. That was Jim Guthrie, right? Yeah. Yeah, who did Sword and Sorcery, which is an amazing game for the iPad yeah. and the iPhone. Um, and his soundtrack's great. Yeah, um, And you great can kind soundtrack. of hear the, the iPad influence like, musically on some of them if you pay really close attention. Um, but also a game designer was talking about using Paper, um, which is a new mm -hmm. Sketchpad app. It's absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, just in game design meetings and to kind of just quickly jot down ideas and then have everyone else kind of just collaborate on that one thing and he's saying it's kind of replaced their you know giant whiteboard that they used to use um, those are the two interesting like most interesting to me um, ways that people are using them you know that Sam Spratt who used to do illustrations for Gizmodo and mm -hmm. occasionally for Gawker and is like a wonderful illustrator yeah. um, he did a post on I think his tumblr uh, a week ago or so that was um, 
it was about using paper actually for like sketches and and what for him his takeaway was like it's if I don't have a machine like a big machine it like is a perfectly capable and kind of cool app for this like yeah. it really works. Um, I use I I used to do this more, but I'm writing less now, so I do it less. Uh, but I I used my iPad with Simple Note to write because it's just like it's sort of like a typewriter mentality. You just yeah. have it's a piece of paper free. to write on, so it's yeah. just totally distraction free. I'd hook up like a Bluetooth keyboard to it, and a lot of times I would just sit the iPad next to me and mm -hmm. just like type, and I'd be like, I can get I'll edit later. Um, so I. I really enjoyed it for that, um, and if I wrote more, I would probably still be doing it for that. Yeah, I mean, the takeaway from your post, Thorn, for me was that it, you know, I'd always thought, I, I'd always struggled to see the iPad as a tool you could use to do things, mm -hmm. um, and more of an entertainment consumption device, which Apple has clearly been trying to push that well, out of the, the way. It's the easiest but, sell, though. Yeah, right? yeah, it is the easiest sell. Because it is really good at those things. Yeah, the, no, it's great at it's But great it's at not that, just but, a gimmick, like a lot of people said when it first yeah, came out. Yeah, but you can, you can totally, there, there, there are things you can do if you just, like, I had been thinking about it like a computer. And I think that was the problem, is mm -hmm. if you think about it like a computer and you want to do all this computer stuff, well, it's not going to be good at that generally. Yeah. But if you want to, if, but as an idea generation tool and as a, like a scratch pad for whatever creativity, mm -hmm. uh, creative activity that you're doing, it seems like it's really effective for that. And I hadn't really thought about that until you wrote the post. So it seems like there are, uh, you know, there are a lot of good apps and a lot of good ways to, um, to, to take care of your creative needs. Cool. Yeah. All right, well, uh, that's it for us this week. Um, awesome for Thorin to join us. <laughs> yes, thank this you, Thorin. This, this is a new thing that we're doing to Skype. Alan came in last yep. uh, last week, and uh, it actually it's quite so, nice. Thorin yeah. is sitting across the room from us, uh, actually just like the fourth person on the table looking back at <laughs> yeah. us. It's, uh, I have been scolded for looking down at him instead of looking at the camera. I didn't scold But if you're you. listening, <laughs> you didn't notice anyway. But anyway, thanks for watching, and uh, we will see you next week. Bye. If you'd like to ask us a question, send us an email at tips plus ask LH show at lifehacker.com. Alternatively, leave us a message at 347-687-8109. Try to keep your questions to about 30 seconds so we can keep the show moving. And thanks for watching, listening, or however you're getting this podcast from the internet to your brain.